Future Now Show. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Hey Futurists, it's me, Miss Metaverse, and welcome to the Future Now Show brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. I have a great guest for you today. Joining me from Dobson, North Carolina, is futurist and writer, BJ Murphy. Hey BJ, how you doing? Doing fine, yourself? Good, good. So you have been working out some really, really awesome stuff this year. And one of the things that I saw that you wrote was a chapter in an outstanding book called The Future of Business. Mm -hmm. Now, your topic was body shops. Yes, the future business of body shops. What are body shops? Well, uh, I suppose it, it requires a little uh, backstory behind it. When it comes to tattoo and piercing shops today, those are the closest thing to a body shop at our current period of time because we're going into tattoo shops and piercing shops to augment the human body and our own individual preference. With body shops, however, we're sort of morphing the tattoo and piercing shops that we know of today into the industry of plastic surgery. Uh, we are not just wanting to put some rings on our part of our body or ink the uh, underlayers of the skin. We're wanting to enhance the human biological substrate with advanced science and technology, whether it's through cybernetics, uh, 3D printed prosthetics, or even through gene editing. And so it's sort of, it's not just to transform the current shops that are being used to modify the human body, but to also transform the plastic surgery industry as well. Because when we think of plastic surgery, costs a lot, takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of uh, healing process. With the body shops, we want to try and transform that entirely where it's cheap, it's fast, and it doesn't, you know, it will allow you to enhance yourself beyond uh, what the current biological substrate provides uh, given its limitations. Now, there's a lot of talk about body shops, right? Because all we kind of see now are bits and pieces on <clears throat> news or perhaps in blogs. And all we see now are kind of very sensationalist pieces that talk about how people are having uh, kind of implants in them. What kind of yeah. implants and things are out there now? Uh, the, the most popular ones uh, would range between the simple but effective uh, finger magnet implants, which allow people to have a sort of what, what they would like to call the sixth sense. Uh, where they can, they're able to actually feel electromagnetic waves uh, that are normally uh, invisible to the naked eye. You can't feel them. You can't do anything with them. They're this invisible uh, realm of the world of which we have absolutely no perception of. Uh, but with these magnet implants, you're able to actually feel the shape of that current. So you're given a whole new perception of the world. Other implants, um, more popular ones, are the RFID and NFC tags, which are being provided by Dangerous Things. Uh, and they range in uh, what you can do with them, uh, from opening up locks to your doors to turning on your motorcycle if you have one or your car. It's adaptable. You can program it to however you want. Uh, and I, I, I was actually talking to uh, Emil Grafstra recently, and uh, they are working over at Dangerous Things, trying to figure out a way to integrate the mobile payment systems like uh, Apple Pay and Samsung Pay with these NFC tags. So whenever you want to pay for something, just have your hand wave over the register and it's already done. Payment's done. So th those would be cool little features that we can start doing today, but that's going to be enhanced further down the road. Right. And... So it kind of seems like little small things are available now, but where are we headed to in the future? And how is that going to affect, let's say, our everyday lives or business? Oh, well, I mean, where do you start? You know, uh, it's, it's hard to try and fathom where we're going to, 
uh, go from here. Uh, you know, no one like 20 years ago would have ever thought that there would be someone living today who has an antenna uh, surgically uh, attached to someone's uh, back of the head, which allows him to hear colors. Uh, Neil Harbison, the UK cyborg, no one would have ever fathomed something like that 20 years ago. Uh, but it is our current reality. And so where we're heading 20 years from now, it's it's really difficult to try and understand just what the, the many possibilities that will arise from these advanced technologies. But we have a relatively good understanding as to where, we're, where we might be heading five, 10 years from now, and that is with 3D printing, especially, uh, as it's exponentially growing, the price is dropping tremendously, and it's allowing the prosthetic uh, industry to really transform it into a, an everyone-based uh, industry. It used to be just for the wealthy and for only the adults, because these corporations, they, they didn't feel comfortable given it to children because as they grew, they'd have to get new prosthetics and it would require all these different measurements. But with 3D printing, that's no longer an issue. And so that's dropping down the price and uh, how we can augment these uh, 3D printed prosthetics, that's gonna give us a whole new possibility. But that's just in the wearable section. Uh, eventually with these implants and gene editing tools, we'll be able to provide medical implants to where people will be able to have 24-7 uh, access to their entire genetic makeup to where they can monitor their heart rate there they can monitor whether or not uh, especially once nanotechnology comes in these implants will be in sync with these nanobots we will be one with the machine essentially and that will give us constant communication with these machines it would be essentially kind of similar to the internet of things only we're involved with the communication finally so uh where we're heading it's essentially the merging of man and machine uh and what that means is to anybody's individual preference it's hard to determine uh given just how radically different each mindset can be it's a fascinating idea I, it's true everything is kind of in its own place today and when somebody wants to say, uh, kind of change their aesthetic appearance by going mm -hmm. to a plastic surgeon, you just go to the plastic surgeon. Or uh, even if you were to just have liposuction, you have liposuction. Or everything right. has very different compartments. And also, it also seems that right now, that type of body modification, like you're speaking of with the magnets in your fingertips, or um, I've even seen a light go underneath somebody's skin, uh, LED lights, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's Those are the new there. ones uh, by Grindhouse Wetware, more aesthetic than anything else, but yeah. Right, and it, it does seem like, you know, right now those are being performed only in tattoo shop type of environments, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, pretty close. Uh, there is a new show that just recently came out. It's in its second episode called Darknet. Uh, it's uh, made by uh, Vocative, I believe. I believe I'm pronouncing it right. Mm -hmm. uh, where on the second episode, they actually went into dangerous things and all the, the, the biohacking movement. And what was pretty clear on that was that, you know, you had these business type peoples coming in and they're getting these little implants, the NFC, RFID tags. And yet the people who are providing it were these people that were most definitely came out of a tattoo shop. They were covered in tattoos. Uh, they had uh, ear gauges uh, larger than mine. Uh, it, it was pretty clear that uh, there is a clear dichotomy between the biohacking world and those who want nothing to do with it. But the fact that we have these business types coming in who are interested in getting involved with it, even if it means putting an implant in themselves, we're seeing a emergence in those two worlds. It's not so much a conflict, but uh, one of which we find common ground that perhaps we can have the business types and the quote unquote punks or the outcasts of society because we see something about our upcoming future of which everyone's gonna benefit it from.
regardless of what your class background might be or where you particularly work or what you choose to do with your skin. You know, those are all irrelevancies to us regarding the future. Right, and it seems to be a divided line between there's people who are receiving robotic arms or legs and people wearing exoskeletons, and those are in the medical field. But then there's like the subculture of the grinders, like you're speaking of, of the mm -hmm. things and, and the biohackers. And what's it going to take for the two to become one for us to go forward in the future together? Well, um, it's going to require the medical industry to provide a little bit of room or a li little bit of benefit of the doubt to the biohacking community, the grinders especially. Uh, right now, they're you know, we are finding ourselves in a, a, a position that is similar to where the transgender community was for the longest time. You know, the, the medical community wanted nothing to do with them. They did not want to provide any sex reassignment surgeries whatsoever. And when it comes to the biohackers and the grinders, they want nothing to do with them. They don't want to provide any of the uh, surgeries nothing to allow them to make that transition from man to cyborg. They, they want nothing to do with it. And so how we can convince the medical industry to actually get involved because the biohacking community wants the medical industry, but we, you know, we don't want to just remain in the shadows. We don't want to be uh, forced to risk our lives just to get an implant because every biohacker is, uh, no matter how professional the person is when there is deregulation, when there is no medical oversight whatsoever, that puts the patient at a risk. And so if we can figure out a way to convince them that biohacking is more than this mere want, then perhaps we can bring these two together. But then that brings up the question of uh, how can we convince the medical industry to change their definition between needs and wants because even with simple things like prosthetics uh, if someone needs or if someone lost a limb whether it's an arm or leg insurance companies will provide uh, plenty enough to give you low-tech prosthetic uh, sometimes not even that uh, you get a wheelchair or cane or whatever a peg leg uh, but it if a person wants to actually thrive as a human being, whether it's to simply be able-bodied again or to be more than that, uh, these insurance companies are not going to provide it. The medical industry is not going to provide it. And that's a big problem. We should be emphasizing on having people to thrive as opposed to simply getting by. We don't need getting by needs. We need thriving needs. And that's what the biohacking community is providing. And hopefully we can convince the medical community to join in this journey with us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing, and that's just an amazing topic to think about. And is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? Uh, well, just uh, keep your eyes out about the future. These things are happening every single day. The, you know, when we say these things are growing exponentially, we're not kidding. You know, these there's going to be an advancement every single day. Uh, when I was writing my book, I had to start editing it constantly throughout the months of writing because of just how fast things are moving. The pace of technological growth uh, is accelerating, and you need to keep up or uh, stick with the contrary, and that is to be thrown with the dustbin of history. And for us, that's not an option. We hope you join us. Thank you, BJ Murphy. Thank you. Let's go build a better future. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Woo!